Amen. Good to see you all out this evening and take some time to pick up where we were left off this morning in the Church of Laodicea. And we are looking at, of course, this period of time when Christ is standing outside the door of the church at Laodicea knocking to gain entrance. And the reason why he is out there is because the church has lost its whole concept of sanctity. Sanctity before God. And they think that as long as they meet and get together, God will be just happy to show up. The fact is, that's not the case at all. But this Church of Laodicea is not the only church that's lost that concept. I think it's been lost through, it's been lost in the reality of the vision of, of, of a great deal of professing Christianity, including many Baptist churches. I do not want to present ourselves as we are somehow above all of this, and it's one of those things we must guard against as much as anyone else. Tonight we are going to continue looking at the problem of building upon the, a new rock. And that rock is not Jesus Christ anymore. We're not building upon the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Many churches are not. They're gathering crowds on a whole new dynamic. And Jesus Christ is essentially just secondary to it all. He's not the primary reason why people come. And they are looking for some spiritual high. And it has really nothing to do with Jesus Christ or anything like that. We read this morning Haggai, Haggai chapter 2, verse 10 through 14. And we saw there in that text when God asked the priest, if you bear holy flesh in your garment and uh, with that skirt of that garment you touch something uh, like something that's common, a common element, bread, pottage, wine, oil, any such thing, will your touching that with your skirt because you are sanctified make that common thing holy and of course the answer is of course no it, it shall be unclean if you are unclean what you touch becomes unclean and so that is the process of which we will build upon tonight is rock music an appropriate form of, wor of worship is it something we can use um, my wife and I were at this funeral yesterday and we were there and, and of course they wanted to have some congregational singing and the words came up on the screen and of course we knew the songs they were great old songs but the background music was very contemporary offbeat uh, all of that and I was thinking as as I sat there and I didn't sing because I, what I what I'm going to teach tonight about the law of sacros sacrosanctity is that if I'm going to offer something to God and then behind that, it's prompted with something that is defiled by God. That's a foolish thing. It's not only foolish, then what I offer to God has also become unclean. That's the very principle that we see here tonight. So even though the words may be good words, the music is what defiles it. And we have to be careful about that. Some people say the music doesn't make any difference, but I will tell you tonight that it does make a great deal of difference. And you don't need to be a, a musical a person who knows music back, for, backward and forward to understand this. I'm not a musician. I can't even read music. I know when it goes up and when it goes down. I know when there's some pauses in there. I know a, a, a sharp and a flat and those kind of things. But I don't know. I can't read music. But I don't have to. Because everyone in this room, and I mean everyone, even you know Daniel and Kaylee, they're younger, but everyone else knows about this because you all grew up in the culture. You grew up in it and you know what it is, the rock culture. So I was saved in 1969 in a Bible church, an IFCA, Fundamental Church of America. The church was Presbyterian in polity with a board of elders while purporting congregational polity, which of course is a contradiction between the two. We have a lot of Baptist churches who have boards of deacons who, of course, which is essentially Presbyterian polity, is not congregational polity at all. But the pastor of that church emphasized personal soul winning, separation, was an expository preacher, and the church grew to over 500 people strong using Jack Hiles philosophy of, of evangelism which was the one, two, three, say it after me, evangelism method. I learned that. I used it. And then a bus ministry. 
and we had seven or eight buses running every Wednesday night for Awana at that time and for Sunday school on Sunday morning. And we were reaching a lot of people. It was very seldom that uh, a week went by I didn't accompany someone down the, down the aisleway to go forward and make a public confession of, of faith in Christ at the end of the service of someone who I had, had made a profession of faith with me during that week uh, in their home. But I remember the pastor remarking in the early 1970s about a popular gospel music album that had just come out recorded by a man by the name of Tennessee Ernie Ford. Now, most of you older folks know who Tennessee Ernie Ford is. And the pastor warned, and here's what he warned, he says, he warned about the popularizing of gospel music by the musical industry. And he said it would do great harm to evangelical Christianity. And the premise behind his statement was that sacred music should never be used to, to entertain because it is sacred. It's, the purpose of that music is for worship. It's not for entertaining people. And so he drew a, a line of distinction. Sacred music or spiritual music was always to direct the worshiper's attendance to, attention to God. It was not intended to make the worshiper feel good about himself or to enjoy it. And I ask people about uh, that type of music today, and they say, well, I like it. I like it. That's the whole premise. What that means is it makes them feel good. Well, worship music isn't about making you feel good. It's, about, it's directed towards God. So less than a decade later, 10 years later, or less, that same pastor that made that statement started a Christian radio station that began playing contemporary Christian music. Ten year, within 10 years. The local church that he spent most of his lifetime building was destroyed by his compromise in the very next decade and finally dissolving. There wasn't anybody left. There were like 20 people left. And, uh, but, you know, essentially they went somewhere else and the church dissolved. And today there's an evangelical free church in that building. And why? Well, he had removed the rock Christ Jesus and began building upon CCM another rock which was not another. And uh, uh, he, uh, of course, destroyed his own work, the own work of his hands. Now, there are thousands of such testimonies about the destruction of local churches through the rise of CCM. I personally know of hundreds of such testimonies. I've been involved in seeking to recover some of them. In most cases, the elderly people who made enormous financial sacrifices to build those churches were sacrificed by the new pastors who were more concerned about church growth than they were about the sheep who cried out to God against this intrusion upon the purity of their worship. And that's the reason. They understood it. They grew up in the culture. They understood what it was. So just because a man has a theological degree does not make his methodologies theological. And they were adding these things in to church growth to build a church, to attract a younger crowd. I'll see this church die before I do that. That's not going to happen. You say, well, that's pretty narrow-minded. Yeah, that's, that's right, you got it. That's not the way we do things. That's not going to happen. Now, maybe you will, you know, rise up in insurrection, throw, my, uh, throw me out of here, <laughs> and that's up to you. You can do that. But as long as I'll I'm the pastor of this church, that's not going to happen. Everything in life, including music, can be used to build up or tear down. And there is music that builds up, edifies. There's music that tears down. And if you were to ask in what way rock music has, has been used over the last 60 years, anyone with a historical connection to the culture that rock music produced would answer that rock music corrupted everything and anyone with which it was involved. Drink of the cup that rock music serves up and you drink of the cup of devils. I grew up in that culture in the late 50s and early 60s. Those were my teen years. Rock music is pagan in its origins and demonic in its outcomes. Rock music is a cultural aberration. And if rock music has any business in the church, that business is evil business. 
The, the business of rock music has always been demonic in destruction. And this has been its history for thousands of years. It did not originate in the 50s and 60s or even in the 30s with the uh, jazz music. To use Christian rock as a tool for church growth is an oxymoron in terminology that creates a paradox in practice. Everything it touches, just as Haggai says, shall be unclean. Everything. <laughs> You know, I'm embarrassed even to stand before you today and tell you exactly what the words rock and roll mean. They are that vulgar. And CB, CCM just tones that all down and says, well, just contemporary Christian music with, a, with, with rock music. <laughs> what did Haggai say in Haggai 2, 4, 14? Let's read this text and we'll have, an, have a word of prayer. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. That's his description of intermixing the common into the holy. Everything that is intermixed, everything that that individual, whether it's a priest, who's, who, a believer priest who plays it on the piano, or uh, any other instrument, or sings it from his voice in a manner which is worldly, is unclean before God. Now we'll show you many more verses of scripture that deal with that. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you tonight for your word, and we thank you for the many Old Testament examples we have of this same thing. Knowing, Lord, that your word says there's nothing new under the sun, and we certainly see it. It's just repetitions of Satan using the same old garbage, to do the same old things and destroy uh, people's lives. We pray, Father, that your people would understand and learn. And that, Lord, they wouldn't cop out in order to cop in uh, to something that is popular. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 15. We've, always, we've looked at this portion of Scripture often, and I'm not going to go into the details of the exegesis of the text. I'm just going to read it in the general sense of what it says. It's about the Lord's Supper. But the carnal pagans who had been saved out of paganism were integrating paganism into Christianity and into the practice of the Lord's table. They had brought the pagan love feast into the church. And in doing so, they were... Uh, separating out from themselves individuals who maybe didn't have a lot of money and so you had some people who brought in great uh, opulence in their food and, and drink and uh, there was all kinds of nonsense going on and they made uh, the Lord's Supper into a meal, a big feast and that wasn't what it was supposed to be. And so Paul addresses this and he begins in verse 15, he, he says, I speak as to wise men. Men who know the difference. People have discernment. I speak as if I'm speaking to people who know the difference. Judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? He's talking about the Lord's Supper. Is this not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Communion is what we have in common, or what we... the. the the, the fellowship that we have together. Verse 17, For we, the spiritual temple of the local church, being many are one, we're all unleavened, we're all one bread. The concept of the, the one bread, concept of unleavened bread. One body, for we are all partakers of that one bread, Christ the manna from heaven. So verse 18, Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of sacrifices, partakers of the altar? The priest who offered the sacrifice, didn't they also eat of the, of the sacrifices that were offered? Yes, they did, except for the burnt offering. What say I then? That the, the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which a Gentile sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. You shouldn't be bringing these in and integrating them into the church. He's talking about bringing meat into the church 
and using it in the Lord's Supper that were sacrificed to, uh, to devils, or food that was sacrificed. They had offered all kinds of food. Uh, and of course, that's what happened, of course, in Buddhism. You, you brought food and you put it before the altar. He says, I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You can't integrate these two. So Paul is referring to Christianizing the pagan love feast. And the idea is that the pagan practices cannot be integrated into the church's worship. And uh, you cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and, and, of the, and the table of devils. That was a love feast. You can't be a part that you can't. These two things don't go together. Now, why are elderly believers resistant to CCM? Well, they have some discernment. They know that they're resistant because they're the generation that were living near the birth of the rock and roll culture. Believers who are in their 50s and 60s and older lived through the 1950s and 60s. And they saw firsthand the growth of the rock culture and its effect upon a society. I played the lead play in my senior year in high school of a play called Rebel Without a Cause. <laughs> there was a reason for that because most of us were rebels without a cause. And uh, we had a teacher and that's all that. Well, you know, that's something we want to promote. We want to have people rebel against these archaic beliefs of mom and dad and pick up this new lifestyle which was secular humanistic. They saw firsthand the worship of rock idols like Elvis to Pelvis, remember him? And the rise of the free love culture that grew from the rock culture. And boy, that really, really took off, didn't it? But then the culture developed a problem. With all of this free love, you had all kinds of pregnancies. And the pregnancies had to be dealt with. Because you couldn't have little girls giving birth to children and nobody to take care of them. So now the solution of the liberals was, let's have abortion. And Roe versus Wade come in. It wasn't, had nothing to do with women's rights. It had, it's just that the liberal culture couldn't sustain uh, paying for all of these children and the outgrowth of how they were going to be when they grew up without daddies. So only the most ignorant of that generation were not aware of the sensuality of the syncopated music with its backbeat or its offbeat. And for those of us that were lost in our sins, the music moved us and we liked it. There was no doubt in our minds about where it moved us and upon what the music focused our thought life. We, we knew exactly what it was. And occasionally we heard the words of the, those songs, but especially those words that spoke of rebelling and doing things our way. Remember that song, It's Your Thing, you Do What You Want to Do, I Can't Tell You Who to Sock It To? Now it's not possible for me to give you the rest of the words of this song because they're so vulgar. But it was a popular song of my generation. That's rock culture. Those that grew up on the foundations of the rock culture knew the hidden messages in the songs like Puff the Magic Dragon. Oh, Peter, Paul, and Mary said, oh, that's not about marijuana. No, 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 that's about something else. That's a children's song. <laughs> they knew exactly what they were doing. And the other song, The Candy Man. Candy Man can? Remember that song? <laughs> oh, yeah, The Candy Man. Who was he? He was the man who distributed the uppers and downers. And we all knew in our culture growing up in those days what the candy was. It was methamphetamine. This was a music of a cultural revolution. It was a revolution against any, anything moral, absolute, and Christian. Then the movie di industry came in, and they began to produce uh, things that, uh, of course, moved people away from uh, all of that. Well, rock has never changed its goals. Rock has always been anarchistic, an anarchistic <laughs> and anti-Christ. It always has been. If there's any wonder that this same generation, generation resisted Christianized rock music when it was introduced into the church with new words, <laughs> well, no. Is there any wonder that the same generation resisted rock music was introduced into the church as appropriate for worshiping music? No, they were saved out of that culture. 
They didn't want to have any part of it anymore, and they certainly didn't want it brought into the church. So, that was archaic thinking, and you had to get rid of that, that whole generation of people in the church. They either, they either opened up their minds to it, or they were excommunicated from the church. Now, those growing up in the birthdays of the rock culture always knew that rock music was about the message in the music itself. Not the words. The message in the music itself. You listen to it, and you feel your body moving in rhythm with it. And it always moves in a certain way. Right? That's the backbeat. That's the offbeat. It's sexual. And it moves you in that way. Now, we under fully understand the message of the music. Rock music was about sex. The big key is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They all went three, they all went hand in hand together. The words were only extensions of the message of sensuality and rebellion. And that is why worldly music cannot be married with godly music. They don't go together. In Amos 3, verse 1 uh, through 3, God here is speaking to the children of Israel. And he says, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel. What were they doing? They were intermixing paganism and idolatry in with the worship of Jehovah. Like Eli's son, Atmai Phinehas, was doing uh, at the tent of the tabernacle, uh, inter intermixing Baalism and fornication right there at the, at the entrance of the tent when people came to worship Jehovah. And they were integrating this in with the worship of Jehovah. He says, So the Lord spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up out of the land of Egypt. This is the whole nation of Israel. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your inequities. And then he talks to them and, him, and about him. And of course, the message here in verse 3 is, Can God walk with you if you're not agreed with me? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, it's a universal principle. If we're going in two different directions, can we walk together? No. And that's what God is saying to Israel. You're going in another direction, and I'm not going that direction. If you want to walk with me, we're not going to walk together. And if we don't walk together, I'm not going to bless you. That is the same message to the church today. Those who want to do this kind of thing. For most people of my generation, rock music in the church is like a preacher at his pulpit preaching the word of God while pornography flashes on the screen behind him. I, I like Dr. Danny Everson's uh, book. Uh, he makes a similar ob observation about rock music playing in the background while trying to obey Philippians 4.8. And there it says, finally my brethren, or finally brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these. So keep your mind focused on pure things. But how can you do that when, you're, when your music is filling your mind with sensual things? Here's what he quotes from his book. Uh, uh, the book is it calls, entitled... Uh, um, Sound Root Steps to Building a Biblical Philosophy of Music. It's available, uh, of course, uh, through BibleRevival.com, and of course you can order it on the um, Internet as well. Sound Roots is the name of the book. It's, you know, 200 and, it's about 400 pages long, so it's, the guy was in music all of his life, taught, not taught music at the college level for all of his life. But here's what he says. Although audience may, be a, may attempt to focus on the performer, and although the performer may, may be expressing things which are honest, pure, lovely, and true, Philippians 4.8, the audience cannot help but absorb some of what is presented in the background on the stage. Even if the audience were able to block out the background by their own self-control, is it right for the producer to place offensive background on the platform where it becomes a stumbling block? There's really no way to separate the performer from the background while removing the backdrop or removing or moving the performer away from the backdrop because they're integrated. 
Similarly, the words of a musical selection may align with Philippians 4.8, but the music must provide an appropriate background and platform, or a conflictive message, conflicting message will result. This principle can be seen both in individual cases and music selections, and in the sense of an in, the endless drone of public musical background, which presents society tolerate, which present society tolerates. <laughs> this is what he's talking about. It's Philippians 4, 4 through 9 there. I think it comes up on the screen. But he, you know, on that last verse, in verse 8, he says, if, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what? Think on these things. Think on these things. Keep, this is where you need to keep your mind focused. Not on being entertained. Now, worshiping God through worship music is a sacrifice of praise. As the fruit of our lips. We have to see music that way. We're not singing just because we sing. And we need to think and concentrate upon God when we sing hymns. Now, I don't know about you, but that, sometimes that becomes something I have to work at. Why? For one thing, we sing the same hymns very often. And the words become um, mundane to us and redundant. And so we can sing the words without any thought of God whatsoever. That's, you know, that's not worship. That's just singing. Or we sing a song because we like the sound of the music and the way it comes forth is pleasing to our ears. Now, there's nothing wrong with it being pleasing to our ears, but the purpose of a song is to exalt God and edify the believer. It must build up, not tear down. It must exalt God and not simply be about God. It exalts him. It praises him for the things he, who he is and for the things that he does. And so it is an affirmation. Songs are affirmations of the things that God has said and affirmations of our own faith and beliefs in God. And so as we sing them, it uh, probably would be good occasionally not to even put the music to them, but just sing the words. A cappella is good sometimes. I think it, it does a good job, even though when I lead songs, a cappella is more painful than it is helpful. But Because uh, uh, I have a hard time carrying the, the notes. But the Old uh, Testament uh, rabbis would sing the psalms, and that's the psalms that were sung. They didn't, have, they didn't always have a musical accompaniment to them, and they would sing. Sometimes the choirs would sing a cappella. Many churches used to be, before we had inter, in, instruments introduced into the church, um, everyone was taught how to sing parts. And when you had a, a, a song leader up front, the purpose was he was leading the choir of the congregation who all sang parts. And it was practice. <laughs> Maybe, you know, that'd be a good thing to have. I was, uh, when we had uh, uh, revival meetings, and I can't remember the guy's name that used to go along with me sometimes, and he would actually train the congregation as uh, he was here with us one week, and uh, he would train the con congregation how to sing parts, and it was really quite nice. So any sacrifice must be offered in sanctity before that offering can be accepted to God. Any offering. Every old covenant believer needed to be physically sanctified by a baptism, by a ritual washing, before he could enter the temple or offer a sacrifice to God through the priest. So as he brought an offering to God, the offering had to be perfect. He had to be washed and cleansed, including his garments, before he came into the temple to offer the sacrifice. Then the priest took that sacrifice, killed it. It was examined to make sure it was perfect and without blemish. It wasn't crippled or anything in any way. And uh, then he would kill that animal, take the blood, and then the animal's parts were washed before whatever part was going to be offered to God was washed again in the bronze labor before it was offered. Sanctity. And anybody knows that when you butcher an animal, uh, how difficult it is to keep it clean, right? And that, of course, is what these people understood. They weren't going to offer something that was unclean to God. So everything that w were part of that offering, the cleansing of the person who killed the animal, the cleansing of the individual who brought the animal, the cleansing of the animal itself, that it couldn't begin with a blemish, all of that was there. 
So all the offering as well that needed to be, the offering as well needed to be sacred. Every animal had to be without sickness or a physical blemish. And before the offering was offered to God, every aspect of worldly filth by which it might be contaminated needed to be washed away in that bronze labor. What does all this specificity regarding offerings and sacrifices of the Mosaic Covenant teach us in the New Covenant regarding offerings that we offer to God in the New Covenant? Certainly our sacrifices must be equally sacred and cleansed from any kind of worldliness. And God does not accept any sacrifice from anyone that is not sanctified. Hebrews 13, 15. Great verse of scripture. By him, therefore, by Jesus Christ, our high priest, who is already sanctified, right? <laughs> now you see the bottom up way it was came before it was offering. You have to understand that it came from the top down as well. The high priest had to be sanctified before any offering could be acceptable to God. Every aspect of the priesthood that offered had to be sanctified. They had to wear sanctified garments. All the instruments they used were sanctified instruments. So from the top down it had to be uh, sanctified. From the bottom up it had to be sanctified to that moment of offering the sacrifice. And of course that is our service to God. So he says, by him, Jesus Christ, therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Otherwise this comes from the heart. Now, I think oftentimes that our, the reason why our worship is defiled is because our heart's not in it. He says, that is, otherwise now he's explaining, explaining what it is to praise, offering this sacrifice of praise to God continually. Here's what that is. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. That's what should come forth naturally from our songs. I watch people sing in the congregation and oftentimes you will see as they sing a particular hymn or something that really moves their heart and thought and remembrance of certain things that they, they get emotional about it. Because why? Their heart is in it. And they're being touched by that hymn. Now, just in the few minutes left we have tonight, the law of sacrosanctity. Sacrosanctity, two things coming for, together here. The top down, the bottom up. The top down is what's sacred. The bottom up is what's sanctity. If the sacred is going to meet with the sanctified before it's ever acceptable in worship to God, those two things must be in common. Nothing worldly can be part of something that's sanctified. And the same is true of something that is sacred. It is God's and God's alone. That's what the whole meaning of sacred, sacred is. It is something that is used uh, by God and for God alone. It's not used for any other purpose than that. So we certainly learn a lesson about the law of sac 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 sacrosanctity from the two sons of Aaron. What were their names again? Nadab and Abihu. And I didn't think it was important. They didn't think this was a big deal. It tells us in Numbers 3-4 that Nadab and Abihu died before the Lord when they offered strange fire before the Lord. They didn't think it was a big deal and they lost their life. Now, maybe that solved the problem. Every time that we sing a song that's not sacred, just immediately your life would be taken. Or, anytime we sing a song without thinking of God and really getting our heart into worship, poof, you're a pile of ashes in the pew. Now, aren't you glad it didn't work that way? But if we kept that thought in our mind, this whole concept here of strange fire, what made the fire they use strange fire? Now, let me explain this to you. They were the individuals who offered the incense before God. That was the prayers. And what they did is they take these censers, these places where the incense is put on, and they take coals off the altar. And they put that at the bottom, and then they put the incense upon top of those coals from the altar. 
So the incense of the tabernacle was intended to be typical of the prayers of the sanctified people. So the burning of this special sacred mince of, mix of incense wasn't allowed to be used. You can say, well, I really like the smell of that. I'm going to take it home with me too. No, it wasn't that you, could, you couldn't do that. But this sacred mix of incense was to be lit only by coals coming from the great brazen sacrificial altar. And this, it tells us in Leviticus 6, 9, this is the law of the burnt offering. It is a burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. Otherwise, it was never allowed to be extinguished. There was always burning coals there, and those coals had to be kept alive. Day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, those coals had to be kept alive by adding to it. So there had to be someone there all night long adding to that fire and keeping that sanctified sacred fire burning. So the sacred fire of the brazen altar was always kept burning all night so the next day's fires could be started from the coals of the sacred fire from the day before. You get the picture? See, that is the way we are to be. Uh, we are always, we should always keep the fire burning in our hearts and our lives. And so the next day's fires can be started from the, from the coals of the previous day's fires. That's sanctity before God. When you're really serious about it, that's the sanctity of the God. What's the first thing you do the next morning? You start adding some fuel to the fire, right? And you get up and you do that. What did Nadab and Abiah do? Well, they took coals from a common fire, a fire that wasn't the brazen uh, altar, not from the sacred fire, and they lit the sacred incense with that. And what happened to them? And they died before the Lord. It tells us in Leviticus 10.1, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein, otherwise from a common fire, and put incense thereupon, or thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord. You see the two? It had to be the sacred incense and the sacred fire. They had to come together. And if you mix the sacred incense with the sacred incense with the sac uh, with a common fire, it wasn't acceptable to God. To the degree that it created a capital punishment by God for these two men who traversed what God had commanded. Well, now tell me that God doesn't take music seriously. You say, wow, you're stretching that. No, I don't think I am. I don't think I am at all. And it says, and there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them that they divide, died before the Lord. What is this? The point of the sacred fire is it is intended to be pure, it is intended to purify, not to punish. But because they offered strange fire to God, common fire, and put the incense upon this common fire, God brought fire which was punishment upon them instead. Did not purify anymore. It was a fire of chastisement upon their life. And it was a pretty serious one. Now much of what is happening in contemporary Christianity in the emergent church movement is really varying degrees of this same thing. It's neo-paganism. What is neo-paganism? It is any time you break the law of sacrosanctity. That you somehow can intermix that which is sacred and that which is common and God's okay with that. No, he's not. It is neo-paganism because they adapt heathen pagan worship practices with which to worship God. And one need not search too far without discovering the use of syncopated music as a major aspect of pagan worship practices. This is where it came from. And it's ancient. You can go anywhere in the world today in the pagan cultures where there is tribalism, whether it's here in the United States, whether it's in Africa or South America, whether it's in uh, the uh, tundra of, of the, uh, you know, the uh, frozen tundra of the north. Go anywhere and you'll find this everywhere. Paganism and syncopated music. What are they doing? They're calling the demons. They're calling the spirits is what they're doing to assemble. 
Well, I don't go very far to find that. Common to the mystery religious was the practices of ecstasism and enthusiasm. This is from a book by um, S. Angus, a book called The Mystery Religions, details uh, these two practices. And there, these were methods of getting people worked up to stimulate and simulate a religious experience. Otherwise, in some of North American, um, Native American cultures, they would go into the sweat lodge, smoke Paiute, take some particular hallucinogenic drug so they could experience their spirit guide. And the spirit guide would come to them in some hallucinic experience, hallucinogenic experience, and they would interpret this as, of course, spiritism and, of course, an uh, experience with the gods. And they used it for guidance. But uh, there, there are, these are kind, uh, the kinds of things that must be down uh, to manufacture, uh, must be done to manufacture that uh, does not already exist in the heart. You have, to, you have to work it up. You shouldn't have to be worked up to worship, right? I shouldn't have to yell real loud and, and uh, use a more emotional stories to get you all stirred up uh, so that you can feel like you've had a, a, a Christian uh, or religious experience, or we don't have to have enthusiastic singing and those kind of things. That comes from the heart. And if it's not in there, you can't manufacture it. But that's what this whole culture of CCM is trying to do. When the worship of God is in the heart, there's nothing needed to bring it forth. It will burst forth. It flows like blood through the veins of a living person. It's that natural. Here's what Angus says in his book. Ecstasy, or ecstasis, and enthusiasm, uh, he uses the Greek word enthusiasmos, both of which might be induced by vigil and fasting, tense religious expectancy, whirling dances, physical stimuli, the contemplation of sacred objects, the effect of stirring music, inhalation of fumes, a revivalistic contagion, such as happened at the Church of Corinth that was going on there, hallucination, suggestion, and other means belonging to the apparatus of the mysteries. This was all common stuff. And we're seeing it introduced back into uh, evangelical Christianity at the end of the church age. Why? Because the same thing that happened in the Reformed Church, in the Restoration Movement, it was all really just nonsense in most of it. And people wanted to come to church and feel like they've had some kind of religious experience when they're, they didn't have salvation and their understanding and relationship with God was superficial, maybe non-existent, and they wanted to work this all up and manufacture it. Both ecstasy and enthusiasm were used to produce a heightened sense of euphoria to the religious experience. And no one in the pagan culture gave any thought to the fact that their religious experience was being carnally manufactured. They thought this was normal, and that is what people do today. They say, well, you, you people over there, you, 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 you're just a dead old church. All you do is you teach, just teach the Bible, and there's nothing uh, really exciting about your church. <laughs> Well, it is if you're excited about the Word of God. If you're excited about the, about the teaching of the Word of God and being a follower of Jesus Christ and learning how to do that and what, what, it, what defines it, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting about having the potential of living a sanctified life before God and to be used of God, if nothing more than just to be in the right relationship with God. That's exciting. To be able to begin every day with the, with, the, with the knowledge that I am right with God today. Not because of who I am, but because of what God's doing in my life. And there, there's a joy and a blessing in that. I don't need to work that all up. The reality was that such practices were simply the carnal manipulations of, persons, of, of the person's emotions. And that's what's going on. Actually, his involvement had been has been more with the supernatural realm of darkness, but not with the light of divine presence. Why does Christ stand outside the door? Because of the preoccupation with the realm of darkness, not of light. That whole culture is a, is a realm of darkness. That's a mystery of inequity. 
Exorcism and enthusiasm were satanic in origin. They didn't come from God. They have no place in the church. But that is what rock music is all about. That is, that is the same instrument that the devil used uh, thousands of years ago and he's been using from, from almost day one in all the practices of paganism back to Cain. Adapting pagan worship practices with which they worship God was a sin of the mixed multitude in Exodus 12.38. That came out of Egypt in, in Exodus. And, and what does that teach us? Be careful about the mixed multitude. When, when the mixed multitude comes into the church, that is people who are not, do not have a serious consideration about being sanctified before God. Someone who comes into the church and their main goal is church growth, look out. That's a dangerous individual because they're going to be willing to sacrifice a lot of things in order to grow the church. I experienced that actually one time in the church I was a resident evangelist in, and I saw that very thing happen. I didn't know what was going on initially because uh, the traditional church, the mainline older Baptist, met upstairs without even knowing that the pastor had hired an associate pastor. We know that he hired him, but we didn't know what was going on. And he was building a whole different church downstairs. And what was the goal? That new church downstairs was going to grow to the place where it took over the church upstairs. But we put a stop to that. We stepped in and said, no, this is not going to happen. We find an excellent representation of this neo-paganism in Exodus 31, 1 through 6, where Aaron, Aaron, the high priest of Israel, leads Israel astray by making a golden image to represent Jehovah, coupled with worshiping Jehovah with the pagan music, licentious feasts, and the riotous living of Egyptian paganism. How can this guy be talked into this? There's a serious problem here. I don't understand how I, I, some of these pastors I know, I've known them for years, how they get talked into this nonsense. But the point is that you can manufacture all kinds of emotions and artificial worship, but the problem is that the Shekinah does not show up. He's standing outside the door knocking to get in and calling you to repent. This is equally true of the high priest of the church, Jesus Christ. He's, that's the one who that is. Do not expect his blessing presence in the absence of the personal and local church sanctity. Until there is a genuine repentance, he stands outside the church house knocking to gain admittance. Look at Exodus 32. In just a few minutes, we'll read this and we'll close. Moses has been up on the mountain now for close to 40 days, not full 40 days. And the people are down, of course, you got the mixed multitude stirring up trouble and say, well, you know, he brought us out here in the middle of the wilderness and, and uh, you know, we're going to just be left out here to die while he's up there in the mountain. He's probably dead anyway by now. He's probably died up there and uh, we don't know what to do. And so when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down out of the mountain, verse 1, and the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron. Now, who are these people? This is the mixed multitude with the individuals who are uh, the believers in Jehovah. But notice what's happened. We have a Baptist church meeting taking place. Those who are the loudest and the most, uh, uh, um, we would say, the most uh, influential, influence everybody into saying, well, it's not a big deal. Let's just worship Jehovah, but let's do it the way that we did it in Egypt. Only now, we won't say that this golden calf is the pagan god. We'll call this golden calf Jehovah. And we'll worship him the same way we worshiped him, only we'll worship Jehovah with the same methodology that we did in Egypt. Now remember, they didn't have the law yet. They didn't have the direction from God here. So the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron, all of this mixed multitude with these believers, and said unto him, 
Make us gods which go before us. Moses isn't going to be there anymore. Make us some gods that will go before us. Now how are these gods going to go before us? Remember the Ark of Covenant hasn't been built yet. They're going to take a golden calf, make it, and carry it before them like they, they did like, like after God carried the Ark of the Covenant. Now that wasn't God in the box. That represented their redemption. He says, make us gods which go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want now uh, what is become of him. We don't, we don't know where he's at and what's going on. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. Now this was, of course, the slave's mark. This earring, this, by the way, ladies, when you have this pierced ear, by the way, <laughs> that was a sign that you were a slave. That's, that's what that was. The other place they put it was in the nose. Isn't it funny that that's what's going on today? You know, people pierce their nose and pierce their ears. Yeah, you wouldn't do that. That's between you and the Lord. But, uh, and Aaron said, I, I don't have one, by the way. Probably won't get one. So they did that. And all the people break off the golden ears. Otherwise, they had a pretty good participation here. I don't know whether there were some that said, hey, I don't think this is a good idea. There probably was, but all the people did it. Uh, and brought them unto Aaron. And Aaron, he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made, it, uh, made a molten calf. Otherwise, uh, he had melted them all down and then shaped this thing after he had melted it down uh, into a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. What blasphemy. Now, there are a lot of people that are going to die here in this as a result of this. And I believe a lot of those that died were these individuals who were the leaders of the pack. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a, is, a, is a feast to the Lord, a worship feast to the Lord. Uh, Jehovah here is the word in, in the Hebrew text. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. There was a celebration. And we know from other portions of Scripture that they got naked sang songs, drank booze, and had a pagan love feast, which essentially was a, which was a um, fertility cultist orgy. That's what went on. I believe there were a lot of people that didn't participate. You want to know why that? I, I believe that, because they all didn't get killed. There were a lot that didn't participate. And the, and the truth we learn from this is that neo-pagans always replace God with objects or tangible rep, rep, representatives. It doesn't have to be a statue to be an idol. Music is an idol today. In many cases, music has become the idol. And this is what has been done with contemporary worship music. Contemporary worship music replaces God and becomes the object of worship. And this mixed multitude of contemporary worship music certainly de describes the emergent church where gathering a crowd has become their objective. Their motivation as evangelism is covert to the mixed multitude. They want to keep the mixed multitude happy. And whatever it takes to keep the mixed multitude happy, you have to sacrifice sanctity in order to do that. Because the mixed multitude will not be happy and content within a sanctified church. They're not going to be happy there. They'll always be under conviction. And they'll never be pleased with what goes on there because it's just not worldly enough. Spurgeon said once, this was years ago before the church was not nearly where it is today, but he, he spoke of the fact that the that you can't bring a carnival into the church and expect it to be spiritual. Something to that. 
effect. It can't happen. But today that's what's going on. I just, I just pray that God will forgive us. When I talk about that, I'm talking about all those that name the name of Christ. And we have to remember that we're part of that. And we have a lot of people that aren't knowledgeable enough about these things uh, to really speak to them. You don't have to be a great, uh, you don't have to, have to have a doctorate of music to be able to understand these. This is just very practical truth. You can't bring in something that which is common and mix it with that which is sacred. Because in doing so, you're offering strange fire to God. Our Father, as we close our service tonight, we praise you and thank you for the many portions of Scripture that address, that address the principles of all of this. We know, Lord, that you've given us much clarity about it. And yet the world is going to fight for the things they love. But, Lord, you have told us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of, of the Father of you is not in them. And, Lord, it's not our desire to look upon them with contempt, but with compassion. For they have been deceived and now have become the deceivers. So we pray for them, Lord. We pray that they would see their nakedness, see their blindness, understand their deafness, and realize they're not even saved, or they wouldn't be doing the things that they do. So we pray, Father, that we can be the testimony and witness for them that they need to be. And the music thing, I know, is a secondary issue, Lord, because the problem is they're not saved. So we pray for them. We pray that we can be effective. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Daniel.